Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Jay and welcome to Simple Church Online. Whether you missed last Sunday, you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe even watching out of state, we're so glad that you're a part of our community. And we're praying today that as you watch, God would use this to bless your life. Enjoy the message. That song is it's such kind of a long and, and different song. We don't do it often, but it felt very fitting for today as we talk about the feet of readiness. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, um, I just have a heavy heart. Just the past few weeks, the, the constant you know, violence that's happening, the, the frustrations between different sides, and, and all of these things that are happening, it, it's, it's just heartbreaking. You look out into this world, and it's just, you wonder, where, where, to, where to start? <laughs> like, where, how do we change this? How do we change the course of our nation? How do we change what's going on in our world? And, and it's, it's overwhelming. And so I think that today is a very fitting conversation to, to start this idea of how do we change the world? How do we do something different with this nation? And so um, we're going to talk about... Another piece of the armor, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, we're talking about uh, the, the armor of God that Paul lists off. And he's very specific about the things that he lists. It's very important to him to list off certain things. He starts with the belt of truth that we talked about. And he moves on to the breastplate of righteousness, which Pastor Matthew talked about last week. He did a fantastic job with that. And he moves on here in Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 15, I'm going to be reading this from the NIV. I like the way that it says it. And it says, And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And so here he's listing the armor, and he lists shoes. And we would say, Paul, why are you talking about shoes, man? Like, <laughs> we're talking about armor here. You started with the belt, which was weird. You went to the breastplate of righteousness. Totally understand that, right? That protects all of these vital organs, everything that we have going on. But now you're on shoes, my guy. Like are, you, like, are you big into Air Force Ones? Like, why are you talking so much about shoes? Well, this was a really, really important piece of the puzzle for a Roman soldier and for soldiers back in the day. You have to understand, they didn't have roads. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have these things that carried people to battle. What they had were horses and feet. And so, as they're going into battle, it's really important that they had things to cover their feet. And they, the Romans kind of perfected what was called caligae. And here's a picture of what these would kind of look like. And they, they were semi-sandals and boots, and they kind of just strapped around the feet and around the ankles. And they would have somehow fashion uh, small things on the bottom, whether, whether it was rocks or, you know, any kind of things that they could find to, to make them have some kind of a sole that wasn't slick that could actually help them in battle. And these were a very important piece because you have to think they're marching for, for days on end, sometimes weeks on end. They're going into battle with rough terrain. Again, they didn't have roads. They didn't have ways to get around. And so they're having to walk over mountains. They're having to walk over, you know, all these kinds of things. And you can imagine if you've ever stepped on a Lego before or something that your kid left around. You know what I'm talking about. Every, every parent has experienced that pain, that momentary, I'm going to murder them. Just you can't, That's natural. I want you to know that. You don't do it. That's what makes you a Christ follower. But you think that in that moment if, you, if you've ever stepped on something. But imagine that you're marching for days and days and days and constantly stepping on these things. Again, these are not cleared paths and all of those things most of the time. And so as Paul lists this, it's because a Roman soldier or any soldier would have been like, yeah, like we have to have shoes also because when we get into battle, we need some footing. As Paul is talking about these shoes, these, these caligae that these Roman soldiers were wearing, it was really, really important to them. And so Paul says for us as Christ's followers, we should have on the shoes the feet of readiness with the gospel of peace. What is the gospel of peace that he's talking about? Is there a different gospel that I don't know about? Is there something that's separate from this? No, he's referencing to the good news. And so here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul has lined it out. He says, he, Jesus, he's talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection. He brought this good news of peace 
to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. People, You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him because a holy, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And so Paul says, here's the gospel of peace. It's the good news. It's the fact that Jesus came, died in our place, died on the cross, was buried for three days, and three days later rose again, overcoming death and, and, and sin and pain and all these things we're going to go through. It's already been overcome. And so Paul says, this is the good news that we need to strap up with. What's going what's to hold us firm? What's going to help us walk through the tough roads? It's the truth of the good news. It's the peace that comes along with knowing who I am. That comes from this word that we use in our religious circles called justification. That's a fancy word, uh, and it sounds really smart, but here's what it means. I didn't do anything to receive this gospel of peace. God loved me enough to send Jesus to die in my place. And when I realize that I'm in right standing with God because of that, when I profess who Jesus is, when I believe in my heart that he died for me, I'm now justified with God, made right with God, in right standing. And when that is the centerpiece of who I am, that I am in right standing with my God, my creator, my father, now everything else flows from that. I'm justified, not in anything that I could do, but what God did for me. When we realize that, when we truly understand who we are in Christ, I am a child of God, I am adopted into his family. It changes our thinking and it changes the way that we walk through these battles in our life. So what do the shoes represent for us as Christ followers today? Well, first, they help us to navigate rough terrain. Don't know if you know it, <clears throat> there's some rough patches in life. Things are not always easy. Matter of fact, sometimes things can be downright difficult. I don't know if you've experienced that. <clears throat> there's some days when you don't want to go to work. Be very careful with this one here. There's some days when you don't want to love your spouse. Silence is the right thing. You chose the right thing. <laughs> there are days when you search eBay to sell your kids. These things, <laughs> right? <laughs> Etsy, yeah, yeah, Etsy. I like that. <laughs> some of you have looked to see if it's a tax write-off. I mean, you've gone down dark paths, right? What I'm saying is life is not easy. And Paul, who seems like he has everything together, writes these words in Philippians 4.13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And we'd like to, we like to put that down and mark that down, and that's our battle cry. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I've talked about this quite a bit because I think there's such a huge misunderstanding of this verse. Paul is not saying I can go conquer every single mountain and face every single thing on my own, and I can just do it, just try a little bit harder because I can do all things. He's saying... It doesn't matter what my circumstances are. I'm justified. I'm a child of God. I don't, I don't really care what happens. I can handle anything. On my own? No. <laughs> Shipwrecked twice. Beaten several times. Jailed several times. Snake bitten. You name it, Paul went through it. You think there weren't days where Paul was like, what the heck, God? Are you kidding me? Flogged again? Beaten again? Shipwrecked again? Of course Paul had those days. But Paul had a gospel of peace that he had strapped on. And so as he walked that terrain, he could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not, I can't personally by myself. But Christ, who's in me, who justified me, he's the one who can do it. 
As a matter of fact, before this famous verse, he says another famous verse here in chapter 4, verse 6. He says, don't worry about anything. (laughs) Hilarious, Paul, thank you. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus, written from a jail cell. Paul says, you want to know how to have this peace? You want to how to know how to be able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Don't worry about anything. Give God glory no matter what. Stop living for the mountaintop and then wondering, God, where are you in the valley? Am I not justified because I'm walking through some pain? Am I no longer God's child because something happened to me or, or the, the consequences of my actions are coming true? Like, is, is God just not there anymore? No. You want the peace that surpasses all understanding? I give God the glory in every situation. Is that easy? No. But that's why the center of my being has to be the gospel of peace, the good news. That Christ died for me, that I'm justified, that even come death, I have perfection with God. So we walk through the terrain. We march into battle, not on our own. You see what Paul's trying to do here? Don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. He's he's not saying everything's going to go away. He's not saying, he's not minimalizing what you may be going through. What he's saying is, turn your attention away from your circumstances and turn it to the Savior. Turn it to the one who can actually help. Because you're going to have to walk this terrain. It's going to happen. How you do that and how you're able to stand under that, that, that's up to you. I've given you the tools, I've given you the power, I've given you the peace, the good news. Here it is. Will you strap it on and will you walk in that? That's the question. And it's really easy for me to preach that when things are good. And there was a season in ministry when I could get up here and preach that and I didn't mean it when things were bad. There, were a se- there was a season at the church I was at before this that I could get up and say that and not believe it in my heart at all. I could preach a message like this and then get off stage and and ask God, where are you? I'm a pastor. Why am I having to walk through this? I didn't even do anything. Why am I the one? uh." But I have walked long enough to know that that the terrain's rough. (laughs) That's, That's a given. How I will walk across the terrain is up to me. And I choose to focus on God. So the first thing that the shoes do for us is it helps us to to navigate this terrain, this this rough world that we live in. We talked about the first week, this this idea of truth. We're walking through a really difficult time. What is truth now? It's really, really tough to decipher. It's tough to take stances on what's true, what's what's not true, what's a gray area. It's really, really difficult. That's why I can't do this on my own. I have to walk the line. I have to... I have to allow God's voice to be louder than any other voice and the the gospel of peace, the shoes that I wear to lead me through the rough terrain. Not my own choice. The second thing that it did for Roman soldiers and it does for us is that it helps us stand during the battles. This was a huge deal, like I said, for them. Having some kind of grounding, having those things that that wouldn't slip uh, to be a little bit graphic, it was very, very bloody. If you've seen 300 or any, you know, Gladiator or any movies like that, that's how it was. It was very, very, you know, hand-to-hand, very bloody. It was very slippery. It was just a, it was a mess out there. And so for them to be able to stand, to be able to plant their feet, to be able to be rooted and grounded and ready inside of the battle was vital to them in their victory. And I would just tell you, Christ follower, that the gospel of peace being the grounding peace is the most important part of our lives. Just like with rough terrain, the battles are coming. Now, rough terrain is, is, is circumstances and situations that happen along the way. When I'm talking battles, I'm talking the enemy specifically targeting you. In your weakest, weakest areas, with someone else doing something, I mean, it, it, he will find a way to get to you. 
And then we have an opportunity to either fight or draw back. And I think too often we draw back. We have sh- we're worried about the footing. It's a little shaky here. Yeah, because I'm trying to do it on my own. But what if I literally strapped on God's peace and mercy and justification and went into the battle with that mindset? It's going to change everything about the fight. In, in 2 Corinthians verse 4, let me get there real quick. This, this is what Paul has to say. And again, let, let me give, give this caveat before, before we get started with it. If, if you think signing up to be a Christ follower means no more battles, no more pain, you've been <laughs> woefully misled. A lot of time there should be more battles for Christ followers because we're fighting against the darkness of the world. Matter of fact, if you're not facing any battles, you're probably doing a pretty good job living like the world does. If you haven't, uh, uh, Stephen Furtick said this, if, if you haven't had any head-on collisions with the devil, you're probably going in the same direction. So the, the battles are there. And, and as Paul's writing these things to, to the church at Corinth, to the, to the church in Ephesus, he's writing to people who are literally being killed for what they believe, who are literally fighting battles every day for their life. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. It's going to be really important here in just a second. But we continue to preach. We have the same kind of faith, the psalmist who, ha- who, who had said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, people there will be thanks, great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. Again, this is really important. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So Paul says, you want to know how to fight the battle? Stop looking at the enemy. Stop looking at the thing that's already defeated and start looking to the the, the one who defeated it. We fix our eyes on the things that we can see, the things that we do know. You can't stop situations from coming into your life. You can't can't get rid of every battle that's going to come to you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we have even more because we're Christ followers. So my goal is not to completely rid myself of all these battles and, and just live comfortably. That's nice if that happens, but that's not reality. My job is to strap up and be ready for that battle and fight it the way it was meant to be fought by a Christ follower. Yeah, the stuff's coming, but you know what? I'm, I'm not going to be crushed. And if every single time something comes at you, it's this immediate woe is me. A little bit of trouble comes into your marriage, and so, hey, let's start talking about divorce. A little bit of, you know, a little bit of frustration comes in with, with you and someone at work. So, hey, let's, you know, let's get, go get these other people and start talking about this other person. You know, you know what I'm talking about. The littlest slight inconvenience comes our way, and we just immediately, oh, woe is me. And Paul says, you want to win the battle, it's not about you. Matter of fact, he goes so far as to say, the reason these things are happening to me is for your glory and God's glory. Paul says, I'm glad these things are happening to me. Can you imagine that? I'm glad that I got beaten today. I'm glad that I got thrown in jail today. Why? Because God's getting the glory and because you're getting to hear the good news. That was his stance. That's crazy. Who lives like that? Do I do that? Oh, God, thank you for this persecution that I'm under. Thank, thank you for, 
I love being stabbed in the back. Thank you. That's so great. No. It's, God, why me? But I was looking at their Facebook, and they're, they're enjoying life still. I thought you were supposed to ruin their life because I love you. Right? Mm. Don't leave me up here by myself. Come on now. You think because I'm a pastor that I don't feel those things? You think that I don't want bad things to happen to people who have hurt me? That's why my mind cannot be focused on the things that I want. Because <laughs> when things are good, oh, glory to God. <laughs> He's good. Something bad happens. Oh, hmm. Well, I mean, he's good, but Paul was trying to under, help them to understand that if we focus on us, if we fo- focus on our issues, if we focus on the things that we're walking through solely, then that's what's going to dominate our life. If we focus on God, if we focus on his will, if we focus on his good news for us, then that's what we'll focus on when we're in the battle. So he said, strap up your shoes, man. Get ready to go. Why? Because people need to hear. And this is the third and maybe most important point. The third thing that the shoes do is they take us to the battles. The worst thing that a soldier could do was retreat or cower in the face of a battle. They marched headfirst into the battle. Those shoes that they put on, were strapped up to take them to the war. Is that our mindset as Christ followers? God, take me to the battle. Let me fight. Let me be ready. Too often that's not, and that's what Paul is saying. I I need to go through this battle. I need to walk through this. Why? So that you can get glory, so that more people can hear the good news. It is our job as Christ followers to carry the good news into battle. This world that we live in is broken and sad and lost and hurting. And instead of saying, God, here I am, send me into this battle. We fight for what we want to be right, not for God to get glory and for people to find him. Now, I I don't have time to, we can sit down and talk about politics and and gun issues and all these things. That's fine. I'm not saying that we don't fight for certain things and stand up for certain things. And I'm saying as a Christ follower, my mindset has got to be, how can I carry the good news so that another person can hear that good news about Jesus? Because that's what's going to fix them. That's what's going to help. It's the good news. Hey, you you are a child of God. You are loved and valued enough for him to send his very own son to die in your place. That's how important you are. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 9, this is what Paul says. This message that, I, that right there, that, that Christ died for you, that he rose again, that he loves you, that you're a child of God. That message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the good news. And if you've experienced the good news, Paul gives us a task. Verse 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scripture says... How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. The problem that I see inside of Christianity, and listen, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself. We are so focused on our issues that we have no time to bring the good news to anyone else. The reason that Paul is trying to get people's mind off of the issues is not to minimize it. It is not to say, it, it, you know, 
you know, that, that's not a big deal. Quit acting like that's a big deal. What he's trying to do is say, stop giving the enemy so much room when you have the truth and the good news in you. And spend your energy and time getting that good news out to as many people as possible. And I truly believe with all of my heart that God works everything out for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. I believe that with all of my heart. There are moments in my life when, I'm, when I wonder, but I have seen it play out over and over again. And if we will allow him, he will take what, the e- what, what evil, what Satan, what the enemy meant for bad, and he will use it for good if we allow him. But we have to get our mind focused on him and other people. And I love what Paul says here. How are they going to know if no one tells them? How is someone who lives differently from me supposed to hear about the life-changing good news if I'm yelling about how horrible they are for choosing whatever they choose? How? How are they supposed to know? Do you think I'm going to yell at them about how wrong they are for their sin? And then they're going to say, okay, we'll share more about this loving God. We, we have to shift our mindset. And here's the other piece of this. In, in, in 1 Peter, it says, always be ready to give an account for the hope that you have. Here's where we're going to step on some toes, okay? I'll just tell you right now, it's not going to be comfortable. It's a very difficult conversation. This is not coming from someone who gets it right. Our main job as a Christ follower is personal evangelism, okay? Again, a fancy word. But our main job is to share the good news with other people. That is our main job. We do not do that. Collectively, as the the Big C Church, we do not share our faith anymore. Now, some people do. No, I'm not talking about everybody. In a large majority, we don't anymore. We went through a season in church where we decided we were going to be seeker-sensitive churches, and we're going to draw people in with really cool stuff, and then they can hear about the gospel there. Well, that's great until churches become irrelevant and nobody wants to be at church anymore because all the church people are mean. That was never the structure for church. Church is a place to come together and equip each other to what? Go out into the world and be the church to a dying world. Salvation should happen outside of the walls of the church. Now, hear me. It can happen inside the church. We preach the gospel. We preach the good news. That's fantastic. It should be happening at jobs. It should be happening at ball fields. It should be happening in the middle of a supermarket because we are sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, this is not something that a lot of people get right, myself included. So just know you're in the same boat as most everyone else. It's, it's very awkward. It's very difficult. If I came to you right now and I walked up to you and said, hey, I don't know anything about Jesus. Tell me about the good news. Could you do that? Could you share the good news, the saving grace of Jesus with me? Because that's what Paul's talking about here. We have to be ready to do that. Let me tell you a story that, that I'm, just so you understand that I'm, I'm listen, I, I'm not some perfectionist at this. Emma had a volleyball team one time, and uh, the coach was, was not great. We were losing a lot of games, and she, I, I'm a coach by nature. It's very hard for me to sit in the stands. It's very difficult for me to watch <laughs> from the sidelines. It's better for me to coach, and I did for a long time, but unfortunately we're at the age now where I'm not the coach, and so I, I had a lot of disagreements with how she was doing things, and, and um, you know, it's, it was club ball, so you're just with a bunch of different people you don't know. Mainly what those people knew about me is that I was a, a pastor because I had to be gone on Sundays for some of the tournaments. I couldn't be there. And so everybody kind of knew that I was a pastor. Well, this particular day, I was frustrated. There were some things that happened with some certain people who've hurt me. And again, my mind got focused on those things. And so I'm mad that God's allowing them to continue to live, that whole thing. Uh, no, I'm just, you know, I'm joking. You get what I'm saying. And so that's where my mindset was at already. And I'm a protector by nature. Uh, it comes from my, my mom. She is. Uh, she uh, once brought a sign. I, I didn't play. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I feel like I'm supposed to share so much stuff here, but 
my mom brought a sign because I wasn't getting to play because I was four foot two in like eighth grade. So uh, she brought a sign that says, put my son in. And I asked her to never come to a sport again. But <laughs> my mom fought almost every ump that made a bad call. In our, I mean, like my mom was the protector. Uh, my brother got kicked one time in a football game and they actually ejected the kid. And I'm, I'm making a beeline for this kid because my, my mom came out of me, and here's my mom just coming right behind me. We were just going to let this, you know, he was like in ninth grade at the time. I don't know what I was going to do, but I was going to let him know you don't do that to my brother. Anyway, so that's where this comes from. I didn't feel like Emma was getting the right, right playing time. I felt like she was kind of getting picked on a little bit by the coach. And so we're kind of in the heat of this moment. This girl misses a ball that she should have had, and the coach laughs. That was not the right thing to do in that time because I was very frustrated. So I yelled out at the coach, at basically this girl. <laughs> it wasn't for her, but it was just a kind of about her. Like, coach, you need to yell at everybody. You can't just single people out. Like, everybody's to blame or nobody's to blame, you know, blah, blah, blah. Total spectacle of myself, right? I looked like an idiot. These people don't know me very well at all anyway, and here I am randomly in the middle of this game. I've never said a word, and I'm yelling as loud as I can. And in the moment, it felt justified because I was mad. But I went home and I was more embarrassed than maybe I've ever been in a really, really long time. That was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And I, I, I shed tears over it. I asked God for forgiveness. Um, I tell you that to, to show you an example of what it looks like to let my circumstances overrun what my priority is. I, I'm a pastor. They knew that. And so now... They don't know me. The, most of those people on that team don't know me. They just know that the pastor yelled at the coach, right? And I'm not saying that I, I ruined an opportunity to share Jesus with them. I'm just saying in that moment, it took a lot away of what my job was supposed to be. So I, I'm not telling you these things because, hey, you get it right like me. I'm telling you that this is what we're supposed to be focusing on. And let me make it a little real and a little harsh maybe for, for you where you're at. If all that you talk to your friends about is sports, if all that you guys talk about is your favorite kind of beer or, you know, whatever the thing is you like to drink, if all you talk about is those other people in the office and their stuff that they deal with, and you never talk to them about the good news, how are they supposed to know? How are they supposed to know that, that God loved them enough to send his son? That's our responsibility, not the church, not the church. It, it is not the church's responsibility. You understand that, right? It is not the church's re responsibility to share Jesus with your kids. Do you understand me? We have, we have delegated the job of being a Christ follower to the church, and that was never meant to be the structure. We come together and we equip, we, equip, we hold each other accountable, we, we, we hear the, the scriptures read together, we sing together, we celebrate together. It is our individual responsibility to share the good news with our friends, with our family, with our kids. It is our responsibility. Do not leave feeling defeated. Leave feeling like I need to change some things if this is not the passion and the desire of my heart. Because when we, when we really understand the gospel of peace, when we really understand that we've been justified, that we've been changed, that should dictate the rest of our lives. And if it's not, if that's not at the center, if we're always just so focused on us and our issues and, and we can't ever just go out and share the good news, something needs to change in our lives. And I, I know for me, as much as I share that story, to, to let you know how, you know, I mess these things up too, there's a lot of times I do get it right. And I have dedicated my life to living as best as I possibly can for Jesus, to sharing him when I possibly can, because how can I not? And I understand, the, you know, the scripture even says that as a pastor, you're under a microscope. That's fine. I, I, have, I, I live that life gratefully, and I'm going to make mistakes, but I own up to it, and I move forward. And I wonder in your life, will you own up to your personal responsibility inside the kingdom? Who have you shared the good news with? Who, who, who looks different from you, acts different from you, loves different from you? Who have you shared the good news with? That's our responsibility as Christ followers. And if we're so focused on ourselves, if we're so focused on the woe is me of life and those things, how can we ever get the good news to those who need to hear it? 
I'm not minimalizing what you're going through at all. Please, please, please hear me. What I want to do is I want to take the power of that away from your life. The enemy has no power over your life unless you give it to him. My prayer and my hope for you is that the good news, the gospel of peace, is the loudest thing in your life. And at the end of the day, no matter what, that you know that you're a child of God, that you're loved, that you're valued, you have a purpose, you have a destiny, you have a reason for being here, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's the center of who I am. And then out of that, my responsibility, my job is to go into the world and tell people that same good news. Let me tell you about what Jesus did for me. And I'll end with this, but we're stepping on toes, so we might as well continue. You know, we always say, well, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. Well, boy, you should be. Why, why not? Why do, we, why do we give that caveat and say, it's okay if you don't know? No. This is available for anybody to study. There's all kinds of study tools out there. Like, again, we, we've, we've somehow decided that it's the church's responsibility to know the Bible and then feed me a little bit. No, that's not, that's, that was never the structure. It is your job to study and understand and memorize and know Scripture, and then we come together and we do this, we equip each other and get ready. Now, again, churches, uh, we're equipped to do these things, and we study, and that's all great, but it is your job to know Scripture, and it is your job to know why you believe what you believe. And it is your job to know how to speak against atheism and things like this. It is your job. It's not just the pastor's job. How are you doing with all this stuff? Now, again, I, I'm, I'm not here to overwhelm and to make you feel bad. What I'm saying is maybe there needs to be a mindset shift. Maybe I need to start focusing on other things and not focusing on myself. Let's not live in a kingdom of me anymore. Let's worry about other people and taking the good news to them, okay? So here's what I want to do. And I talked a little bit longer. That's okay. We did have a break there. I, I want you to, and, and Colby, if you'll just turn the lights off real quick. I, I want to take just a minute, and uh, it's okay if we run a little bit late. It's easy to think about this in big terms and, and big things, and yes, the world needs to be saved and all that. But who is a person in your family and in your life at your job that needs Jesus right now? One person. I want you to think of just that. Don't think about the world and the problems because it's overwhelming. Think about one person right now. And we're going to sing a song. And, and you're welcome to sing along. But I also want you to take some time praying for that one person, maybe two people that you know of, that need to know the saving grace of Jesus. And then I'm gonna, I want you to pray while you're doing this, while we're singing this song, that he would send you to be that person. Not wait for someone else, not invite them to church. You be that example for them. Once again, thank you for stopping by today. We'd love for you to be a part of our family at one of our services at 9 or 11 on Sunday. You can find out all of our information at simplechurchtulsa.com. And we'd love to pray for you any way we can. So please message us and we hope you have a great week.